Greetings to the brightest audience in the country. This is Real Science Radio. I'm Fred Williams. And I'm Doug McBurney, Bible student, amateur comedian. And Fred, it's great to be back with you talking about real science on Friday. Oh, sorry, Doug. Just had a car speed by the studio. Okay, yeah. not really. <laughs> but it's something I thought would be really interesting to talk about, which is the Doppler effect. So, you know, our roads are finally clear out here. We had a snowstorm here early in the week, and the weather's now nice. So let's talk about the Doppler effect. What do you say? Yeah, hey, that sounds interesting. In fact, I remember, uh, speaking of real science, we had a real scientist on just a little while back who mentioned off air that aircraft transponders used to identify the aircraft on, on air traffic control radar, they have a Doppler problem. But we never really had a chance to talk about it. And uh, and then and, and maybe we'll get to a news story here or there if we have time, Fred. But yeah, let's get into some Doppler. Yeah, sounds good. So, Doug, you're referring to a show we did back in August, and it was with Dr. Phil Dennis, and it was on distant starlight in a young universe. So we had a conversation off air after that show. And there were some things we didn't get to that we wanted to. Well, this whole Doppler conversation, it actually has an impact on one of the other theories out there on how we can see distant starlight, which in my opinion is one of the most difficult things for a biblical creationist to answer. But we were, you know, we're getting a lot of good ideas out there. And, uh, you know, yeah. the physicist, Dr. Dennis, he had some really good ideas on that. And again, that shows back in August, we've done a show back last year on plasma cosmology and just trying to deal with this whole thing about distant starlight. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I remember, I remember back in August, now that it's warmed up a little bit, it's kind of reminded me of August, back when we had, we had uh, Dr. Phil Dennis on to explain his, his theory of distant starlight in a young universe. And by the way, Fred, that was right when we started the Real Science Radio YouTube channel. And Dr. Dennis's interview still holds the record right now for the most views of all the videos on our channel. And, and by the way, folks, if you're watching on YouTube right now, be sure to hit the subscribe button if you like what you hear. S subscribe now before we get banned from YouTube. And, and, and anyway, that was a, f a phenomenal interview. And, and But we had some unfinished business, right, Fred? Yeah, that's right. In fact... We briefly touched on Jason Lyle's theory. It's referred to as ASC or anisotropic synchronous convention. And I think Dr. Dennis has some good insights on that too, but we never got to talk about it and we never got to talk about the Doppler effect. So Doug, it sounds like we're getting into a lot of real heady science here. And I think we need a physicist to help us out with this. Someone who's, yeah. you know, understands this stuff a lot better than we do. So yeah. I have on the phone none other than Dr. Phil Dennis. So welcome back to Real Science Radio, Phil. Good morning, Fred. Good morning, Doug. Glad to be here. You know, just to remind our audience, Dr. Phil Dennis, he has a PhD from the University of Missouri in physics. So we have the same alma mater. Dr. Dennis's work included providing algorithms for the Hubble telescope and for and tracking algorithms and other mathematical algorithms. He's a real expert in mathematics as well as physics. And he's actually been recognized by NASA for his work. So I, I really think, Dr. Dennis, you're the go-to guy on this stuff. Well, th well, thank you, Doug. I mean, Fred. <laughs> I need to take another sip of coffee. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, there were a few, there were a couple things we weren't able to get to on our last show, um, including your critique of Jason Lyle's distant star-like idea that uh, anisotropic synchrony convention, um, and whether or not we can measure the one-way speed of light, right? Correct. But before we yeah. get to any of that, I'd like to start with your thoughts on the topic you mentioned off there last time we were together, which is uh, the Doppler effect on airline transponders. Yeah, I, uh, that one, I think maybe we need to go to something with a lot higher speed, and that would be the International Space Station. Oh, okay. Yep. Okay. So uh, what this graphic illustrates is uh, the ISS in orbit and a ham operator, radio operator on the ground. And uh, the thing to consider is that the ISS is uh, 
like a server. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a diversity of clients or users and the, the client or users would be all the ham radio operators all over the world. Okay. So there, you got diversity of uh, locations and uh, angles to the, to the ISS. So what that means is it behooves the uh, ground station operators in order to communicate with the ISS that has allocated a frequency band. Think of that like the frequency on your radio, right? Mm -hmm. You know, tune the dial. The ISS operators aren't sitting up there changing the dial, okay? It's the up to the ground operators to tune their radios to be able to communicate with the ISS. Uh Aha, okay. Okay. And so we'll get to the Doppler. We're talking about the Doppler. Many people are familiar uh, with the Doppler with sound. Yes. For example, uh, in my youth listening to uh, living near a railroad track, uh, I'd hear the trains go by. And, of course, their whistles would uh, change frequency as they were approaching and then receding. Right. They would be uh, higher frequency approaching and then lower frequency as they receded. Yeah, so, so the higher that, frequency would be like a higher pitch. And pitch, then, yes. And then and you it, hear it as a yes, and yeah. then up down to a lower, say from a soprano down to a tenor. Yeah, like, like way, Frankie Valley down to uh, Jim Morrison. There you go. <laughs> the yeah, doors. exactly. Right. So <laughs> it, 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 it's an objective uh, phenomenology phenomenon, right? Okay, yes. so we're familiar right. with. So that's a wave phenomenon, and uh, light has its same characteristics. So for light. And, of course, radio waves are a, a part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Mm-hmm. The, the frequency will shift if the transmitter is coming towards you to higher uh, frequencies. Correct. And if it's receding, it'll it'll go down to lower frequencies. So on the graphic there, uh, I'm basically saying that the uh, result of the Doppler blue shift, so if you're on the ground and the ISS is approaching you, and if it's you're going to talk to if if you're going to listen to what it's uh, transmitting, you can't listen at the frequency that it's transmitting at. You have to uh, tune up to a higher frequency. The example would be on your radio dial. You tune up to you know a higher uh, number on your on your radio. You'd go from mm-hmm. six seventy AM six seventy to six seventy five. It's something like that. Yes, exactly. we want to keep you on AM six seventy because that's where we're airing. Uh, that, that's right. Good. We don't 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 change your radio right now. Don't do that. Yeah, yeah right. you can experiment. Do this at home later. Yeah. Exactly. So, uh, what if the ground station wants to talk back? Well, it's going to be blue shifted as if you're heading approaching the ISS. So mm-hmm. you have to transmit lower so that the ISS can receive it. There's actually online. Uh, sites that allow the ham radio operators to compute what their frequency change is based upon their location and the location of the ISS. Yeah. Because you see you see that formula there that the delta frequency is right, equal to yeah. the speed of the ISS divided by the speed of light times some trig, the cosine of the angle between the uh, ISS velocity and the ground station and the frequency, the fixed frequency of the ISS. So they don't change that frequency band, which makes sense, right? I mean, they can't sit there and service. They're not going to keep twiddling their dial right. when, they got a, when they got a whole bunch of people on the ground with varying values for delta F. Exactly. Right? Yeah, make the ground so, vary theirs. Yep. Right, yeah. So it's a server and a client. The client yep. has to uh, conform to the, uh, the protocol of the, of, the, uh, of the server. Yeah. Now, the important point to point, at, point out is that that C is a one-way speed of light. Uh-huh. Right. Uh-huh. So, so yeah, radio, one radio communication is a one way. You don't have to send a signal from the transmitter to the receiver and then wait for the transmitter to get a return reflection. And cell phones have to communicate with a cell phone tower, and it's the same issue. So your cell phone has to make corrections to uh, be able to communicate based upon Doppler fading. Yeah, based on where you're at. But the right, client, and, well, in this case, and, is cell phone user. Well, how fast you're going. So say you're on a high speed bullet train ah, okay. and, and they and they have uh, cell towers placed along the tracks. The uh, cell phone has to make an adjustment in order to be able to, you know, to communicate with the cell tower. Yep. Sure. Because it's the same thing. It's a one way, one way communication. Mm-hmm. The quote is this. The uh, main challenge is the high speed uh, transport operation. And there's these two frequency bands, frequency range one 
are securing poor performance with increased Doppler shift, delivering good and consistent coverage and ins- ensuring seamless and over between uh, base stations along, along the track. And the other important point is uh, a lot of people, I guess, are still 4G as uh, 5G and then 5G is coming into service and 6G phones will be coming and they'll have these higher frequency ranges, FR1 and FR2. So is this mostly a problem only for like high speed? If you have high speed with the cell phone user? Well, this is very interesting. If you can do the calculation with 6G, they're claiming that the, the cell phone will have to correct for pedestrian walking. Oh, really? Okay. Yes. Yeah, right. Interesting. So uh, huh. for uh, for math nerds, uh, the... the uh, Doppler's shift in that formula where the delta frequency is, that's the formula for the Doppler shift. Now, the frequency band, as it goes up to higher frequencies, you get no- more noticeable effects. A lot of people think, well, the velocity of some of these, like a high-speed bullet train or even pedestrian walking, is much less than uh, the speed of light. Well, that's true. That's a very small number. But as this frequency gets up into the high gigahertz range, you get an appreciable uh, frequency shift. I've attempted here to just show what what the issue is with the, uh, say, the ISS. So if the ground station transmits uh, an ISS band, then the ISS will receive a blue shifted signal that's to the right, and uh, the black rectangle is il- illustrating the frequency band that the uh, receiver can receive on the ISS. So you can see it's shifted out and only the overlap is signal that's received. Everything to the right of that black box is signal loss. So in order to get that uh, received signal to line up with the ISS, the second line is uh, the ground station needs to transmit below the ISS band, which is the red, and then it'll be blue shifted and you'll get total overlap. So you, you, it receives all the signal. So it's, sig- it's signal loss, right? So the signal will fade, and uh, you'll lose a, a communication link. And sure. this- so the guys on the ISC, it's like they're trying to get that Mexican radio station as the sun's coming up, and it's just uh, not quite coming in right. <laughs> well, the ISS, is, 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 is in this example, is just listening. So it's up to the uh, ground station yeah. to uh, tune to the appropriate frequency Right. So that when the it, it r- arrives at the ISS, it's within the ISS uh, allocated uh, frequency band. Yeah, so it has to have an algorithm that does all the math that you've kind of alluded to, right? To keep yes. these things so they can be in sync, you know, right. based on where the ISS is located. Right. Yeah. And okay. I understand. I'm not a ham radio operator, but uh, I understand that a lot of the uh, ham radios have uh, buttons that you can use to to uh, pre-tune to various channels and just push a button so it's not twiddling with a dial. And how does how does this relate to uh, anisotropic synchrony convention or the theory of such? Well, if we Lyle claims the the ASC unfortunately is a uh, resurrection of an old uh, model by Hans Reichenbach mm-hmm. back in the uh, early 20th century, I guess mid, maybe uh, 19, I forget, yeah, mid, mid century or before that back in that day, technology was they couldn't uh, claim that they could measure the one-way speed of light because the one way uh, you had to transmit a beam uh, reflected off of a reflector and then receive it back where you are. And the point was, they said you couldn't synchronize clocks and you only have one clock. So it had to be a round trip measurement. Right. Yeah. So don't, and a lot so, of physicists still think it's not possible. Yeah. Right? And so, cause I know Bob and I, we did a show on this. Oh, shortly, not too long before Bob passed, um, right. you know, measuring the one way speed of light. And so I remember when you mentioned it off air, I'm like, yeah, well, you know, we've, we actually talked about it before we did our August show, you know, with advanced technology, it, there does appear to be ways to actually measure the one way speed of light. So that's going to be real interesting to hear your take on it. Cause I believe you're saying that indeed we can with new technology. Well, yes. I, yes. I say the uh, femtosecond camera at, uh, mm-hmm. Caltech, you can actually see a pulse moving through the bottle, which is actually the low resolution experiment. They have higher resolution uh, experiments than the one than that one. 
Yeah. Uh, it only has one clock. I mean, you can see the clock on the video display ticking in the lower left-hand corner. So uh, there's a, a single clock at the, at the camera. Reichenbach, when he proposed that, he basically said something to the effect, well, we don't know when it reflected off the reflector. So we know that if I transmitted at time T1 and I received it at time T2, all I could say is that it had to reflect sometime between T1 and T2, right? I mean, yeah. it couldn't reflect before I sent it, right? And it couldn't be reflect after I received it. But as close as we could get was only that it's somewhere in between those two times. Exactly. Yeah. And what he claimed was that, you know, he just grasped at linear interpolation, right? So he, he said, let's just pick a point in between there. And then uh, based upon that time, let's take an example. Let's say that we claim it reflected when I received it. In other words, mm -hmm. I sent it at T1, I receive it at T2. And this is essentially part of what Lyle's saying. He's saying, well, let's just say that we received it when it was transmitted. So how much time did it take? Well, it reflected at T2. I received it at T2, right? So it, it took didn't no take, time. It took no time, but it traveled a distance they use the uh, Einstein synchrony convention, Euclidean distance to the reflector. So they claim you can know the distance to the reflector and take that R, which is not that distance to the reflector, let's call it R, and divide by zero, right? And then, of course, which is illegitimate, but uh, yeah. right. That's so, how you get infinity. That that approaches infinity, right? Yes. So as the, uh, yes. So I was saying, in, in layman's terms, Jason Lyle's theory, basic, and it has a certain appeal to people because it says that light travel was able, it, Einstein allows within his theory that light can travel here instantaneously in one direction. And so that's how he's trying to explain how we can see starlight well, that's supposedly billions of years. Is that correct in layman's that's, terms? That's, yes, that's exactly what he's attempting to do, but it's just a verbal ruse. I mean, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's, exactly. it's yeah, right. Uh, Lyle... But you said it's Einstein's theory. Well, it really, it really isn't. Einstein uh, in the Lorentz transformation maintained Euclidean uh, uh, spaces for equal time. The uh, Reichenbach convention we mentioned, talked about this briefly last time, is the eternalist. There is no time of reflection, actually. Right? I can yeah. make it anything I want. So yeah. And we've covered that for people who are interested in your uh, last show that we did on distant starlight. If you go back to the August show, we talked about eternalism and you know, what attracted me to your idea is you espouse presentism, which we believe is more theologically and philosophically sound, at least in our view. And right. I was surprised, I think Dr. Uh, Dennis, that, um, that somehow ASC, it kind of, accommodates or is associated with eternalism. So eternalism seems to maybe go hand in hand with it, which is another reason to question it. But, I, you know, maybe you can expound on that because I'm not real up on how it ties into eternalism. But I believe you said Jason Lyle does believe in eternalism. Well, that's what you will deduce because he says uh, based on special relativity uh, and the Lorentz transformation that if – someone could travel faster than the speed of light, they could time travel. Uh -huh. So, uh, right. So that means the past is still there. Yes. The past right. still exists. Right. So that's eternal. Terms. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, as soon as somebody says that time travel is possible, they basically, whether they know it or not, have committed to, uh, to eternalism. Mm -hmm. So anyone right. who says time travel is possible. And that's why you get into all these, uh, crazy uh I, I call them you don't even want to call it science fiction i mean it's science fantasy you know all the time travel <laughs> yeah. all the time travel movies i mean mm -hmm. uh it's unfortunate that uh it gets some credence from uh, secular physicists who talk about it in uh, pop uh you know science expositions and uh, in that last show you had some quotes from einstein where he believes some really strange stuff being yeah right I mean, eternalism he, yeah he said time's an illusion so yeah. uh the the other thing that i try to uh point out to people is that if you're an eternalist uh you're not a three-dimensional object persisting through time you're a four-dimensional object that exists in time with an extension you're extended in time yeah. that you have a head today you, you have a head tomorrow and you have a 
head yesterday. <laughs> so you, so you're a four, you're a four dimensional worm, right? Uh, or yeah. a four dimensional uh, spaghetti being, <laughs> right? With uh, and you don't have actual spatial dimensions. You have mm -hmm. space time dimensions. Yep. Okay, well, if you did say that on the last show, it definitely bears repeating because okay. it's, it's a bit of a mind bending, but it it does help. It helps me anyway, grasp the the sheer fiction of it. Right. Yeah. Fantasy, right. fantasy science. Yeah, exactly. Right. So uh, you have the funny notion that uh, your shape is you have no shape with the uh, Reichenbach convention. Yeah. And so the Doppler effect, it's that's interesting how it communicates with the ISS, but it's really showing just to make sure we can kind of make coalesce this for the audience. It's showing that we can't that there is a one-way speed of light and it's not infinite because if we can measure the one-way speed of light then that kind of argues against there being one direction where it's like instantaneous. Correct. That formula for the frequency shift, as I mentioned, it depends upon the uh, speed the relative speed of the ISS divided by the one-way speed of light. If the one-way speed of light were actually infinite or infinite, not necessarily infinite, but depending upon the angle uh, of the uh, signal to the uh, ground station. But let's take the case where it's going head on, you know, whereas the ISS is heading straight for the ham station so that that cosine is, uh, is one for those who know trig cosine of zero degrees is one. And if C were infinite, you get the speed of the ISS divided by an infinite number, which is approaches zero, right? Which says there's no frequency shift. That'd be a great relief to the uh, ham radio operators. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah. So this right? alone no. refutes that. I, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. 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 So no, I don't have to fiddle with. Don't. Yeah. So as you said, don't. <laughs> you don't need to. Don't tune touch away. that dial. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> There's no need to, <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't touch it. Right, exactly, <laughs> right. So the ISS transmits at the frequency you receive at that frequency. And likewise, you can transmit back to the ISS at the ISS frequency, and it'll hear you. Right? Now, do so, they have any attempts to rebut this? I mean, this seems pretty solid. I, I'm not sure how you would, but I just know how, you know, science can sometimes work as you kind of come up with some kind of, and I hate to say it, but like a just-so story. Have you heard of any attempts to get around this it seems well like a pretty slam there's dunk. well i believe it is there there's some old papers that are quoted quite a bit by one by a person named winnie and uh there's another one the poo which, when yeah <laughs> <laughs> maybe uh that's that's his last name and the whole paper is nothing but a bunch of algebraic uh transformations of uh coordinates and the mistake is that when you do transformation of coordinates, you better make certain that the transformed coordinates have physical meaning. When you, when you do a coordinate change, you change what some people will know is called the metric. And uh, the, the metric is used to convert your coordinate intervals to physical intervals. It, it's like the uh, change of uh, units for one. For example, if we decide to measure everything in, in meters, and I don't tell you it's meters, and I say something's one away, right? And then I do a coordinate transformation, a trivial one, like uh, change it to centimeters, and still tell you, and then tell you that it's 100, but you interpret it as me as a meter, because I didn't tell you what the unit was. Right, right. right. Then you're, you're going to interpret that as 100 meters away. Yeah, sure. Right. Now, that's a real simplistic <clears throat> example. As a matter of fact, why I'm reluctant to actually use that is because that's sort of like the uh, standard argument that the asynchrony, con because they call it a convention. So they're saying if the one-way speed of light is a convention and time synchronization is a convention, so I can make it whatever I want. And, of course, that makes everything subjective. Okay, but, so are uh, they kind of changing the units kind of under the no, covers? Well, exactly. And we, so, uh, you're our resident mathematics expert, so they, they're not going to get this one by you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, th this is entwined with presentism and eternalism also, but uh, what I've shown here is a time axis. Okay, so you're traveling along, traveling along that T-axis that's going from the bottom of the graph to the top. And you're measuring space out 
horizontally from uh, point O to point P. So X is a ESC coordinate and T is an ESC time. Now what the uh, asynchrony uh, transform is, is that you take each point in the present, let's say the present OP, and you put it, move it down into the past as a function of how far it is. The point P gets moved to the point Q. According to the eternalist, you can do that because there is no unique now. So, but the question now is what is the distance according to uh, Minkowski space, which Lyle is using from O to Q? It's it's, uh, according to relativistic physics, the distance to something is the distance between the ends now. Mm -hmm. So according to Lyle, this red line is the now. Okay, so there's Minkowski space, which tells us that the distance from O to P is this quadratic formula. So this is the Einstein Pythagorean theorem distance between O and P. What I've mm. what I've demonstrated here is this is an example of what I said earlier in the session of a metric. So I'm using the metric to convert the space time interval between O and Q using the coordinates T prime and X prime. Yeah. And so- that that's the distance. And the arrow to the right shows clearly that the distance from O to Q is because X is the distance from O to P, right? Right. So the distance, yeah. the distance from O to Q, according now, this is if you're a presentist, right? But you, you see, there's a fly in the or- ointment. They can't claim that they can s- redefine now and then not abide by the rules for what the distance is in now. Gotcha. Yeah. So I, I think for our listening audience on the radio, you can, we'll provide a link. It, it might be easiest to watch the, the slides on YouTube, but if not, we'll try to put those on the show summary. So Dr. Dennis, we're, we're almost out of time. Is there anything else you'd, you'd want to sum up? I know that you had mentioned, um, you know, there's LIGO experiments. According to the ASC convention, you can put a, a synchrony origin anywhere you want. That's the yeah. other thing. Yeah. In other words, it's like a, it's a mobile morphing of, of time according to however you want, wherever you are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Where, wherever you go, be there. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so this shows these blue lines are the, uh, gravitational wave and, uh, coming in towards the earth. And those are the crests. And if it comes in at an angle, there'll be a time delay between uh, one of the blue lines arriving at Livingston. And then that same wave will not arrive at the other LIGO detector at Hanford until another 6.9 milliseconds. Right. So based upon that uh, time difference, you can determine the angle at which the wave's coming in. Now, if we, if we're ASC advocates and we say, well, let's put the ASC origin at Hanford. And this is the second uh, graph below the top one. So say the gravitational wave was coming in, so it impinged on Livingston first with a velocity of inf- infinite, infinite, infinity. Well, it would also arrive at Hanford at the same time. Uh, and right? and okay. they're 3,000 kilometers apart, right? Well, well yes, according to uh, most people. But according to Lyle, <laughs> according to Lyle, it's zero milliseconds, which is zero millisecond light milliseconds, right? Right. Yeah. right. Which is distance of zero, right? Yeah. And right. So, right. <laughs> yeah. For our audience, LIGO is Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, and it was uh, built to try to detect gravitational waves, which have been. So this is an example of one of the first uh, detections. Yeah. So yeah. I do want to say, just kind of as a devil's advocate here, somewhat. Yes. There is questions about. I know there's other physicists like from Niels Bohr in in uh, uh, Scandinavia. I know there's been studies out there where they question the claims of the of LIGO and whether or not they really detected gravitation. You mean somebody at the Niels Bohr Institute? Yeah, yeah, not yeah. Yet, there's a group of scientists there that think oh. that it falls within the noise and that they've it's really uh, conclusions are tenuous. But that you know, so there's interesting stuff on that uh, that you know maybe we cover on another show. Uh, yes, I know we're yes. out of time here for this. Well, one. I know. 
<laughs> I would say we're uh, I'd say we're getting down in the weeds there. Exactly. Exper we are. Experimental <laughs> science. It'll, it'll be over everybody's head. Yeah. Well, wait now. Wait a second. Now, speaking of going over everybody's head, I got to read this email we got from a listener, John, in our audience. He wrote to us after he watched an uh, interview with you, uh, Dr. Dennis. He watched uh, another interview that we did with uh, Sal Cordova. He sent us an email. He said, you folks at Real Science Radio, from way back in the day to now, you never dumbed down any broadcast. Science is done in a technical and jargon-esque environment. It cannot be helped. Once you build up a tolerance for the jargon, which the past years have allowed your listeners to do, you're familiar with it and inured to its false authority of language. Please feel free to let the jargon fly. <laughs> well, that's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so one one more to finish off this slide. Uh, as I mentioned, according to the ASC advocates, everything's just a convention. You can you can place your origin just by definition mm -hmm. wherever you want. So let's right. put the origin at Livingston. Yeah, pick and choose. So when it's approaching, okay, so, uh, and I've got it collinear here so that some of the ASC advocates can't uh, – quibble about well it depends upon the angle of incidence well there's another ah here's another teaser snell's law okay <laughs> and how do lenses work in, in in a universe with a conventional speed of light so let's place the asc origin at livingston so approaching light comes in at the, at the speed of light and according to asc receding light is half the speed of light Okay, so it makes it to the gravitational waves made it from the distant gravitational wave source instantaneously, but then it has to travel from Livingston to Hanford, and then with at half the speed of light, it wouldn't be 10 milliseconds, it'd be 20 milliseconds. What it's saying is, in this case, there's no such thing as a known angle of incidence, right? Yeah, so, I guess uh, just on that one, I, I think that the Doppler is such a slam dunk. On the, on the, on the LIGO, I just feel like they might have a they can use the excuses. Well, they haven't well, anything well, yet. So, well, the, I can give another counterexample. It's called phase arrays, uh, phase array radars. Phase array is a is a radar that does not have uh, like a rotating dish. In other words, yeah. you don't you don't mechanically steer the uh, direction of the beam. You know, with uh, with motors, you electronically steer it by uh, inducing phase changes at a bunch of individual transmitters. Well, that's a one-way speed of light. The LIGO here is basically a uh, passive radio telescope in a way, right? Yep. And so that's another example, radio mm -hmm. telescopes, right? That, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they have some that where the receivers are just uh, stationary on the ground. You can't mechanically steer them either, right? So, so in order to focus the receiver on a patch of sky, you have to electronically steer the uh, receivers. Yeah, so let, just to summarize, so all these examples are showing... A, there's no such thing as distance, really. Oh, the the other one, which everybody admits they claim in the Win Winnie paper, he outright states there's no such thing as a relative speed. And They're all conv it's it's conventional. Gotcha. Wow. Well, yeah. So it, it's it's uh it's it strikes me as a layman as fictitious. Well, that it is. Just that, it yeah. just doesn't make sense. Well, it can only make sense in some really bizarre sense if you believe time is an illusion time tra travel is uh possible and uh you ignore the fact that by your own self-pronouncement you say everything is a convention it, which is fantasy of, right exactly <laughs> fantasy lots of calisthenics and kind of it seems like almost selective you choose kind of what you want to try to get to right fit right, right, right trying to push right. so well we didn't get a chance to talk about that new story but just briefly they're building this huge telescope the giant magellan telescope this thing's like a lot bigger than the james webb space telescope so that'll be interesting to see what happens doug they mentioned in that story about how it's going to give them the opportunity to find potentially habitable planets oh, habitable yes. planets that's habitable right planets. so <laughs> yeah earth earth 2.0 right that's what they're looking for exactly call it, that's right so and i think rsr forget. we can add yeah, another yeah. prediction to our predictions page that that's not what they'll find that's quite a few years out but it was uh you know they're they're talking about it now and they're hoping that thing's going to find captain kirk and spock and we <laughs> <laughs> well hey anyway, dr dennis i want to thank you for some some real mental calisthenics that are good for the brain. This is good stuff. We, it's always yeah. great to have you. Thank you so much for another fascinating 
and uh, an enlightening interview. Okay, can I give one last footnote? The issue is that it's a coordinate transform, and the whole history of, of relativistic physics, there's been a lot of cases of what I call abuse of coordinates. So I say mm-hmm. ASC is an example of that. The uh, Another example was when they discovered the black hole solution called the Schwarzschild solution. There was a lot of abuse of uh, the internal coordinates as to which was time and which was distance. And so they misinterpreted that, and that lasted much too long. So anyway, <laughs> that's that's the summary I wanted to make. Yeah. It's uh, you okay. got to be careful with coordinates. So yep. Okay. Exactly. Well, thanks again, Dr. Dennis. So for Doug McBurney and Dr. Phil Dennis, I'm Fred Williams of Real Science Radio. May God bless you.